So uh, hopefully I can uh, provide you with some more hands-on experience on this and also uh, a little bit more low level, uh, not just the, the, the high level ideas, but also uh, little tiny details that, oh my gosh, what's, what's going on here? Uh, that actually happen when you start trying to do things with finance data. So um, I am a grad student at Caltech and my primary uh, uh, course of study is theoretical physics. So you may notice that I'm not very serious about finance during this talk or machine learning for that matter, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, how uh, to create an algorithm that would actually perform in a competition and have chances to win? And uh, in short, it may be summarized in those uh, three steps. So uh, you, first of all, actually download the toolbox, uh, whichever toolbox you're, you're using. In this particular case, we are uh, talking about Quantax. And get familiar with it. And it has its limitations, so you need to know about them. Uh, second step is that for a particular uh, competition you, and for a particular data set, you need to set up your own uh, optimization and cross-validation routines for your algorithms. And indeed, there are more than one ways of doing cross-validations. It's up uh, cross-validation given the data that you have access to. And it's up to you to decide what is the most appropriate way to do cross-validation. Um, so, of course, your results will very strongly depend on what is that framework that you set up. And only after that, you go to step three over there and uh, you start coming up with those ideas. Maybe we should would look at like momentum, maybe we should look at reversion, maybe we should think about this as a random process, maybe we should uh, look for patterns. Uh, so, and all those ideas, you don't just write them down, you also backtest them using this step two. So not just running system once, but using your own uh, optimization of parameters and cross-validation protocols. And uh, then as long as you believe that your protocols are reasonable for this particular problem, uh, then uh, you will be able to choose and tell whether your strategies are any good. So, and those first two steps actually uh, involve some kind of tricks of trade that are very counterintuitive. So hopefully this presentation will uh, allow you to breeze through them without actually like spending uh, uh, time stressing out about something that is not worth it. Um, all right, so before we even begin, if you go to a economics department in any university and talk to economists about and finance majors about what do they think about uh, quantitative trading, trading uh, they would tell you that stock prices fundamentally cannot be predicted. Actually, there are Nobel Prize winning works that claim that. Well, there are probably Nobel Prize winning works that claim the opposite, but uh, <laughs> the idea is that uh, as soon as there is a uh, uh, signal in the data, something that allows you to make profits, then somewhere in the world there should have been a person that, notice, that would notice this signal. And uh, he will uh, make a lot of money using this signal and he will keep making money until the signal disappears. So, and supposedly this, uh, this response happens really fast and any signal that you saw in like 10 years old data is gone by now. Um, so this is their point of view. But uh, we don't just uh, like think about it in words, whether it's logical or not. We actually want to take a machine learning uh, approach to answering uh, whether like, it's pre is it predictable or is it not? So we want to let the numbers tell us. Uh, and yeah, I guess the question that we're asking in like roughly very simplified manner is that you're given this, this curve that goes up and down and you want to tell what's next. So this is the problem uh, for now. Uh, so now I would like to have a 
uh, a metaphor, so something that you can remember once you walk, walk out of this room. What is that uh, that's different between machine learning and finance? So the classic machine learning task would be this image recognition. So you're given like a, a little drawing of uh, uh, somebody written by hand, uh, a number, and you need to tell what number is this from zero to, to nine. Uh, so the question is what's in the picture? Somebody shows you the picture. However, with price predictions, uh, something else happens. They still ask you what's in the picture, but uh, they hold the picture face down. They just look at you and ask you what's in the picture. Uh, so this is a metaphor, of course. You shouldn't take it seriously. Uh, but there are two important interpretations of this metaphor. So first of all, we are trying to predict what's going to happen tomorrow. So we should just wait and see what's going to happen tomorrow. This is the most natural way to find out. I mean, and predicting is kind of not natural. It's like they hold it face down, and we are trying to say. Um, and uh, more specifically, the processes that are market making tomorrow, uh, the processes that will actually tell which direction the price goes, they have not even started today. And they are very highly random. So what can we do today? Uh, so this is the simple idea. And the idea is that, I guess, the finance is much more noisy for this particular purpose of making money than the typical machine learning data sets. Uh, but you can say that, OK, machine learning data sets also have noise. So I would like to point out uh, another more subtle meaning of this metaphor. So for the image recognition data set, you immediately assumed that there is no correlation whatsoever between different uh, different like rows in your table, like between different uh, pictures that they show you. So whichever pictures the the uh, referee show, showed you before doesn't have any uh, effect on what picture he will show you next. In finance, however, those pictures that the the, the person holding the competition like showing you before uh, actually is the only thing that you. Uh, can use to predict. So you have no other choice than to assume that maybe, maybe they are actually correlated with the picture that he's going to show you next. And this was not the case for those digits. Uh, OK, so now we're done with the metaphor. We can get to more specific and more concrete uh, mathematical things that we can say. So machine learning. Uh, uh, is a general field, and finance is very special part of it. That first of all uh, has the noise that's much bigger than your usual data set. So it would be equivalent in the digit data set to ask it, to asking what digit is that in the picture, we, and you cannot really tell because it's all smeared and like the person wasn't really sure what he's going to write. Um, and there are also other differences. So prediction by itself is kind of not very useful because uh, this is just a number. But this number is where the price is going to be. But the number that uh, the broker actually wants to know, uh, or like your investor wants to know, is what kind of orders do you want to make knowing the, your prediction. right? So you need to convert your predictions into orders of a specific uh, instruments on a stock market. Uh, and the third thing that is kind of subtle, but you also want to keep in mind that if predicting digits uh, kind of is something that you don't really care about intrinsically, right? So if your uh, digit predictor was working yesterday but uh, suddenly stopped working today, you won't go and throw yourself out of a skyscraper. But with finance, it's kind of the other way around. Um, investors take all the risk, right? Yeah, yeah, well, but it's still kind of very uh, emotionally, uh, emotional roller coaster, where you submit the algorithm and wait for results of the competition, or when you backtest it, for that matter. All right. Um, so we would like to proceed. Um, yeah, when I talk about noise, I just like to stress out that 
we actually understand what it is more or less. Uh, it's the contributions to this data that are completely inaccessible to us uh, when we look at uh, other columns in our like, data set. Uh, and uh, they cannot really be modeled with information available to us. And in the case of stock market, there's plenty of those contributions. So there are other players that are doing something, they're thinking something, there are like all those unpredictable events that just effect, go and affect the stock market. And there's also insider information that somebody gets and starts using, but not us. Uh, so all of that is kind of not in our data set. We, and we already know that it's not. So what's left? Uh, it's pretty much clear by the time, like we, I repeated it many times, that it's a hard problem. So uh, let's get technical already. Good, let's go. So we are going to show this slide as a useful slide. I always want at least one slide in my talk to be useful, and at least one slide in my talk to be mathematical proof. So it's actually an extension on uh, just usage of the toolbox as uh, uh, from the previous slide presentation. So this load data function, you should put one into it after S so that it loads the new data. This is something that I only learned today. And actually, I was always loading the, the old data. It was really annoying. But uh, OK, other than that, what this shows you is that after you download uh, the toolbox, you get those standard functions, get settings, and load data. And uh, with those functions, you can easily look at the uh, whatever, what is that that we are trying to predict, the movement of the price over one day. So this. Uh, uh, data close is the close price, and the second index of it corresponds to which futures we trade. So now we've trade futures number two. Uh, so data set is all futures. And uh, the first index is the index of a day. So we just form uh, a, uh, a, vec a, a array of changes, uh, well, in this particular case, a vector of changes of price of this particular futures. Uh, between every like consecutive two days. So then we get rid of nuns and we get rid of the high jumps. So, uh, so that, that to plot a nice histogram. And then we stare at this histogram. Because what we see is that, well, essentially it just goes up and down and it looks like more or less like a Gaussian-ish distribution centered at zero. So, and after staring at it, like we come to a really uh, interesting conclusion that nothing's going to change, right? So just by kind of staring at this data, we see that it's kind of equally likely to go up and down. Um, and uh, this prediction that nothing's going to change actually gives the best mean square deviation of predicted price from the actual price compared to the other algorithms that you may write if they are simple enough. So is that it? Um, if you just measure like the mean square deviation from like the, of the price movement and the actual, uh, so the, and, the, and the, the one that you predicted, like predicting zero for uh, the price movement actually gives you the best. So what do we do? Uh, we, the, we cannot be satisfied with this because we want to make money and if we predict zero every day, like we don't particularly feel like buying or selling something that we don't expect to change. And uh, it means that our objective function that we've chosen, this mean square deviation, is not really appropriate for the task if we actually care about making profits. So we need to choose an objective function somehow favors uh, the uh, uh, predictions that are not zero, even uh, if they will increase the mean square deviation. So uh, this is a, actually a question. So I mean, it's not immediately obvious that this is possible. Uh, we want to make profits with a prediction that is worse at predicting stock market than just this nothing's going to happen prediction. So this is like a mathematical problem 
that I want to demonstrate you the proof as I promised. Uh, so in my talk, there will be one slide with like useful slide and one slide of proof. So this is a problem. I want to show you uh, like a slide of or two of proof. So the problem is as follows. So you have, uh, you want to come up with some kind of prediction depending on the past uh, that you make your decision uh, based upon and uh, you base your decision upon it. And uh, then you just calculate profits uh, as your decision, which is your order times the, the change of price. And you sum it over all days. And these profits, you want to be positive. However, uh, your prediction, uh, we are interested in this kind of counterintuitive case where your uh, mean square deviation of this prediction is actually bigger than the mean square deviation of a trivial prediction. Um, so this is like a, a full formulation of that mathematical problem. So who uh, in the audience, I'd like to make a poll, who thinks that this is possible? Wow, who thinks that this is not possible? All right. Uh, yeah, so this is actually, um, yeah, I mean, like, if we take a majority vote, vote will get it right. This is indeed possible. And uh, it, in fact, since we have this decision vector, right, um, we actually have plenty of ways to make it happen because there is a lot of freedom in how we make our decision. And uh, to prove that it is possible, we just need to give one example of how this can happen. And this is somewhat a contrived example, but something like that can and would, hap uh, and would happen in, in your practice. So suppose that whatever prediction you have, your decision to buy and sell is just a sign of that prediction. So you always buy and sell just one item. And uh, the true change of price that happens uh, every day is a random variable that is minus two minus one plus one plus two with probability one fourth, so one of the four. And your prediction for the corresponding uh, event will uh, be as follows, kind of deterministically. So uh, your algorithm for some reason outputs uh, for these four numbers, the other four numbers, minus one plus two minus two plus one. So it gets it right for big jumps, but it gets it kind of terribly wrong for small jumps. So for this particular decision and prediction, your mean square deviation is 20, which is like two times bigger than uh, the mean square deviation of uh, the trivial prediction. However, we are making profits. So we're making 0.5 uh, dollars or whatever every day on, on, in, in the expectation value on the average. So, all right. Hopefully you are convinced that this is not such a, a strange thing. And indeed, mean square deviation is kind of not, not so useful uh, by itself. Um, However, we may notice another property that kind of also says that profits by itself are not so useful. Because what we have taken is the, the decision is just plus minus one. So we buy only one or, or sell one unit. But if we just set this decision to 10, uh, then we, our expectation value just grows proportionally. So we get, um, $5 every single day on average. Uh, so that's why, I mean, there is some problem if we just say set decision equals prediction and our, we can tweak a prediction in such a way that like it will lead to infinite profits just kind of mathematically. We know that something kind of grows and we just put everything into it like every time. So. Uh, like the mathematically, this problem of optimizing the profits is kind of ill-defined. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, okay, so we can bound the decision, uh, which is the normalization kind of thing, which is what Quantiax is actually intrinsically doing. But another way of thinking about it is we, uh, instead of profits as our objective function, we may want to uh, normalize our objective function so that there are no infinities of that sort. So we construct this objective function where we give uh, something that's our profits in the numerator, but in the denominator, we uh, have um, 
essentially the 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 uh, standard deviation of those profits or like here I did not subtract the mean but the mean is typically smaller than the standard deviation so shouldn't be uh, much difference uh, so this is an objective function that would actually work because there's like a square root that kind of if we increase uh, the profits by 10 like then the, the, the deviations will also increase by 10 um, and uh, by definition of what is called sharp ratio and what uh, we failed to see the slide uh, with its definition in the previous talk but actually this is the definition of sharp ratio if you throw away all the finance jargon so if you don't throw away all the finance jargon it's kind of impossible to understand what sharp ratio is but if you do throw it away then it's kind of actually really simple it's uh, the mean over the standard deviation or given like a specific realization of data it's just sum over all days or a square root over sum over all days of some kind of square um, all right so uh, now it's it kind of works it's a valid objective function uh, conveniently it's also exactly the same objective function that Quantiax uses in its competition so and optimizing this objective function we may come up with uh, something that has positive profits even if it kind of not uh, even if it doesn't uh, predict prices better than a trivial prediction all right but ideally we would want to come up with a prediction that also is better than a trivial prediction of course um, so now uh, there is also another thing that uh, is interesting about Quantiax and this is kind of a technical slide I will come back to it let me just explain what I'm doing here so pretty much everybody who was inspired by my result and went into this toolbox and started working with it eventually started reading this open source run TS function and then they, was, they were completely confused because there is this variable equity and you look again in Investopedia or whatever what equity is and then you look at the code and it just doesn't make sense. So I think that it's kind of instructive to explain what that equity actually is a variable that kind of doesn't make sense. Uh, the variable that does make sense is called fund equity which is the kind of aggregate. So equity is defined for all the futures individually but fund equity is defined just for your portfolio together. So in simple layman terms or in the language we actually speak, a fund equity is just our total money and that day. So all right, uh, now we can actually look at what is this vector of orders that we need to feed into the Quantiax algorithm. And uh, uh, in words it would be that it's a fraction of our net worth or our total money that we decide to use uh, to buy or sell uh, uh, this kind of uh, future number k uh, on, on, on a specific day that we feed it in into the system. So in uh, as a formula it would be uh, essentially the number of shares of the future that is held at the end of the day after we sent our orders times the price of that future and divided uh, by the total money that we have at the moment. So this is the target for whatever the, the, the back end kind of trading uh, that is going on with the broker um, and something that we don't really need to care about but we only need to know that this is the meaning of PK and our returns are to the first approximation just change in, in the price in the same formula and uh, these returns will give you the total uh, if you sum them up it will give you the relative change in the total money but those individual red, uh, red uh, K are actually those equity variables so it's the change in, in the value of given futures divided by your total money so uh, that's why I mean it's not something that like it's easy to say in words what it is because it's only defined really when you have this kind of portfolio this specific uh, construct in this specific way so and this red k is called equity 
So hopefully you guys, uh, if you all ever have trouble reading this RunTS, open source code, then like po possibly it's because this equity is not what you think. Okay, and the notation that we used so far, I called P the decision. Um, so I, I will keep using decision, hopefully you guys are okay with that. Um, now we, we don't do any kind of toolbox specific things. Uh, I, I'd like to talk to, you probably all have question by now, like how do we actually make this decision? What's the, the, at the core of the algorithm? So first of all, I would like to say somewhat uh, trivial thing, but uh, it's still worth saying it out loud that Okay, so this is a uh, way that any time series can be broken into a table that is more familiar for like machine learning and data science purposes. So essentially what you do is that you have like time that's long, you take some chunk of it, and then you du duplicate it for every day that you wanna predict. So you drop it down once, then shift a little bit, drop it down twice. So you get this kind of ladder and then you just kind of collapse it into a table where the last column is what you're trying to predict and these are the, the look back amount of days that you use as features for the thing that you're trying to predict. So in the end you come up with a uh, form that is very familiar for machine learning. You get a table and you're trying to predict a column in that table. Now probably this is not the best way to come up with features so you want to somehow restructure what's in there. Um, all right, so I would, okay. Wow, I would use a decision kind of uh, of that gray rectangle to denote the decision uh, function, the algorithm that we uh, use to get our uh, decision out, our p out of out of features. And there will be a lot of these gray rectangles further down the line. Uh, in particular, uh, the toolbox provides two algorithms already. They're called mean reversion and trend following, and I denote them as MR and TF. In fact, each one of those algorithms, if you look at it, has two parameters, the long period and the short period, which are just the number of days uh, for a particular mathematical comparison. Uh, so our uh, algorithm can be said like it's, it's something that returns a decision based on features given those parameters. Uh, so in more general way, it, it can be written as a uh, decision based on features with some parameters. In this particular case, our parameters are which algorithm are we gonna use and what's the, the two periods. Uh, so there is one more thing here though. We actually have multiple futures, about 50 of them by now. Uh, we can use different algorithms for each one of them. So it doesn't have to be the same algorithm on every single futures. So in our general notation, so we, we want to introduce this index K. So mean reversion and trend following, uh, they kind of, uh, so they return either plus or minus one for every futures. So they, these are the algorithms that work for every future and they return plus or minus ones. Uh, so they essentially split our portfolio equally every day between the futures they actually decided to trade and don't, don't have anything in the ones that are zero. Um, so uh, it's not probably the best way to do it. So we want to have a more general way uh, to split our portfolio. So we denote it in this function kind of that I symbolically say call combine. So suppose that we have uh, a bunch of decisions for every single futures. Uh, and we have some kind of method of combining them. So our total decision will be a combination of decisions uh, of individual futures, say with some weights. And uh, the way to choose these weights is the method that we use. So this is just the notation. And now we can write that uh, our decision function depends on parameters which is which are different for every future. So this which algorithm and periods are different for every future and method is the general parameter. So the method that we choose to come up with weights. So we have a whole bunch of parameters now. Um, every future can be traded with its own set of parameters. Uh, after that, like the naive thing that uh, you would do 
is uh, just uh, see which, uh, if our parameter space for those two algorithms is not very big actually. Uh, so we can just try everything. And we can check what, which one gives the best sharp ratio. And I thought that if parameter space is not too big, we probably won't overfeed. All right. Uh, so I did that. I found the, the parameters and I submitted them. Uh, and uh, this was the Q2 competition. So about a year ago, I lost. This is how the out of sample, uh, the competition days look like. And uh, what happened next. So you see it's essentially kind of stays horizontal. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the way to, to protect yourself against uh, this thing happening is uh, to do what's called like uh, actual out of sample. Uh, in this particular case, I want to phrase it differently. So uh, since you are a machine learning crowd, you're probably familiar with parameters and hyperparameters. So essentially, you can rewrite this algorithm and instead of just parameters, you can put two things there. And I would like to stress out that this is not actually something that people talk about a lot, but the distinction between parameters and hyperparameters is actually completely artificial. So whatever you put into one or another side is kind of uh, up to you. And whichever way you want to set up your uh, kind of machine learning. But then you can uh, have a more sophisticated way of coming up with an algorithm that you actually submit to the system. First, uh, so you split the data into training set and test set, which is test set is your kind of out of sample set. Then you uh, maximize your sharp ratio uh, for certain values of hyperparameters fixed. You find the parameters that maximize sharp ratio on the training set. And then uh, using those found parameters, you actually go to the test set and find uh, the maximum on the test set or over the hyperparameters. So which hyperparameters should, should you have used on the training set to come up with the parameters, right? Uh, so this, these are like the two-step procedure which you need to set up. After the end, at the end of this procedure, you, come, you end up with a set of hyperparameters that you can use to train your parameters and submit one single algorithm. So this is essentially machine learning. Um, Okay, and there's actually a very good reference in Wikipedia about that, which is my only reference. Um, it's this page, and I would recommend anyone to read it carefully. Um, this is an example of what happens when you set up all of that, come up with an algorithm, and actually uh, tune two, param two hi hyperparameters. So this is the space of hyperparameters. And uh, it's represented as a sea with a bunch of islands. So everywhere, like you see a sea of losing algorithms. So sometimes it's really deep because algorithm loses a lot. And you see a bunch of those yellow islands where the algorithms actually are not losing yet. So those are the islands that you want to find. And the more you explore this sea, the more little islands you're going to find and then you probably want to think about which ones of them you like the most. Um, how did the C change, your, how did your topography change over time as you wound up going, you wound up looking at different windows for C? Um, it actually changes in a very interesting way, but it highly depends on the way you set up your cross-validation routine for this, uh, for this optimization. So the, the way you split in training set and test set. And uh, in my particular case, actually, uh, the algorithms worked better on the last few years than, than before, which is somewhat counterintuitive. I don't As you move these windows, is there a fixed point in this? Are there fixed points in this thing? Or is um, basically it winds up being washed across the changes completely? Yeah, so I, I would say that the, the islands stay where they are. They just kind of grow with time which is nice and completely not what I would expect. Um, maybe when the algorithm gets deployed, they will stop growing. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this, that, that is um, what I wanted to tell today. There are also things that I uh, do not really have time to talk about much, but I still want to comment 
uh, on that. So there is slippage in this particular uh, model and uh, uh, some kind of slippage or commission in any trading. So the answer to those economists from the beginning of the talk who think that prices are not predictable is that uh, technically they are wrong. It's actually easy to predict prices, it's just that you only predict the movements that bring less profit if you use them, then it costs in fees to actually do, follow those movements. So there are plenty of stuff you can predict that is useless. Um, and uh, finding something that you can predict and it is useful for making money is what actually hard. Um, so the another, uh, yeah, another kind of uh, uh, two things that I would like to mention really briefly is about greed is a really incredible thing when I wrote this algorithm and I mentioned it to people, it's, you just notice how like the eyes start to sparkle and they start to talk to you and like pay attention to you. But actually like it's just because when they think it's about the stock market, they, it's about money, they somehow immediately make this transition. If it's about money, then it's about big money. It's not always the case. If it has money in the name, doesn't mean it's big money, right? Uh, another thing, personal financial decisions, it's essentially like, okay, should I put my own money into it? And typically, uh, with your own money, uh, buy and hold of S&P 500 is something that is something that probably makes more sense. Uh, that's my personal opinion. I don't have time to elaborate why. Uh, and uh, I, can, I can already tell you why. Yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely true. You need to use a lot of third parties to actually get your trading algorithm out there with your small amount of money uh, of an ordinary person. And whether is it time to start a hedge fund once you get a single algorithm? Well, starting a hedge fund itself costs about a hundred thousand dollars in legal fees, so you need to consider that. Okay? Thank you. Questions. Yeah. So, yeah. Certainly, I, I'm ready to take questions. Yeah. If any, if you guys have questions to either Genia or I just or wanted me, my water, water bottle. Yeah, I also, so I can answer this. I heard the question as uh, whether you want to use the gold uh, five years ago for your prediction and... Uh, yeah, yeah, so that, that is probably true. However, what you can do indeed is you can come up with stable algorithms that work both five years ago and now. And these are actually the only algorithms that you can cross-validate in any meaningful sense. So I guess that's my answer. Oh yeah, uh, please. So what methods do you use to penalize complexity and eliminate variables that are not good for the um, All right, uh, well, complexity is uh, very much model dependent. In general, there is this, this tricky step, right, that I mentioned that you have parameters and then you want to split them in uh, parameters and hyperparameters. So typically, 
uh, your parameters is something that you have a, uh, a formula for. So you directly produce uh, parameters from the data using some kind of like a formula or algorithm. Uh, and the hyperparameters are just the kind of the little tuning knobs in that formula. So you cannot really directly uh, reverse engineer them from the data. So this is the typical rule that allows you to control that no uh, complexity will ever get it to hyperparameters. So we will never make it to hyperparameters. So that's about controlling complexity. Now about uh, throwing away the unimportant features, well, the short answer is, I don't know, you just need to try different features and see which ones don't give good algorithms and then you probably don't want to use them. Yes? Yeah, that's, that's a question that usually people don't answer. I, I would recommend the following thing. Uh, first of all, there are example algorithms. Second of all, there are online a lot of people that share their code for the different algorithms. And uh, this is probably a place to look in, in a sense that to look for ideas and uh, also possibly uh, that their algorithm will probably not be machine learning algorithms. Uh, however, you, they can give you ideas for feature engineering, right? And uh, also they may give you mm, just, uh, what's it called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they may give you like a, a kind of a component strategies that then you can feed in into this uh, uh, cross-validation scheme as I used this two example strategies they've been following and trend reversion. So, and then you just use this cross-validation scheme. You don't really need to use any kind of machine learning tools. You just use the cross-validation scheme and the strategies that you found. So this is something that can potentially be a good idea. However, there, uh, when, when you start wanting to use a tools from like machine learning kind of folklore, like whatever, uh, the random forests is quick and dirty. Uh, so if, if you try that, well, um, first of all, it will be like a more complicated algorithm. So it will take a little bit more work to write it. And then uh, you may find out that it just doesn't work. Uh, so I do not know how to recommend like in this huge world of algorithms, but I am open to discussing. I mean, I certainly haven't tried everything, <laughs> but I, I, I would like to, to, I mean, what, what do you know that works for small and noisy data sets? Probably nothing really works. <laughs> okay. Have you looked at Markov models? Markov models. Um, no, I have not looked at Markov models. In fact, this is some, like, a, a little bit of a white spot in my knowledge about machine learning. I mean, I, I can use their results for any kind of text tasks, but I don't know what's, what's inside them that well to actually write my own. I, I should probably say that actually for these competitions that I won, I had to write my own thing. It, it, it wasn't too complicated, uh, but I didn't use any standard uh, library or toolkit. How does your algorithm correlate to the S&P 500 or something Um well, my algorithm actually is positively correlated. So when there was a drop, then there is also a drop in my algorithm. But unlike S&P 500, my algorithm kind of recovers relatively reliably. So you don't have to wait for half a year for it to recover. It's close to zero. Close to zero? Oh. Okay. You guys mentioned the fees as being like a major sort of hurdle algorithm has to cross. Do you use something like, let's say, Bitcoin in your futures where you're directly on the blockchain and you're not going through some intermediate financial company who's taking big scoops of fees for these transactions? Could you make more, like, could your algorithm have like, a better chance of performing better? Yeah, the way I would say it is that many of the ideas that you would immediately throw away in this scenario would actually work there. And then, do you guys have any plans to add 
Do we have plans to add blockchain or other future markets? Um, as long as there is a good history of data available, yes. But the problem with blockchain, for example, or Bitcoin, is it is simply not long enough around to give us a, a meaningful backtest on the data resolution. So it will take a couple of years before we actually consider to add Bitcoin to our platform. Do you find a significant difference in performance when you're basically using play money versus when you're actually starting trading futures? Oh, that's probably for you. Okay, uh, how close is the live trading result to the back tests? Is that the summary of the question? Not just the back tests, but like you can watch it. You know, yeah. You actually okay. It. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how close are, are these results? Um, pretty much. Okay. Uh, we have to do a couple of uh, things that. Um, change the life result or make it different from the simulated life result of your algorithm. Uh, for once, we have to discretize your positions. So you give us a, a double of your uh, desired allocation in percent of to, to a certain asset. Uh, we have to discretize that to full contracts. So that means depending on the amount of capital we trade your strategy with, this might be closer or not so close to your target allocation. So this is the, the first thing. But the good met mathematical property about that is uh, the larger the amount of capital that we trade uh, with your algorithm, the closer it is to the simulated performance. Simply because the allocations, of the, the area between target allocations and the real allocations that we can get it gets lower and lower the higher the capital is. Uh, so that's that's one of the reasons for it, for uh, the difference. The other reason is, of course, that the real slippage and commission, market impact, all these kinds of things. Um, might be different from our very simplistic model. Uh, but to sum it up, uh, we're happy and proud that uh, the life results match the life simulation very well. And you can look that up on the website as well as on the orange curves of, uh, of the trading systems that we're trading. These are the life results. Uh, they match the simulated uh, life results pretty well. Yes? So, uh, do you, uh, are Samuel risk management or something? You know, uh, drop suddenly you have circuit breaker, or is this you often go through the mm -hmm. or something? Okay, the question was what, what if uh, some shock happens? Do we have circuit breakers that uh, take care that the investor does not lose all its money and so on? Yes, of course, we do have them in production. Uh, we also live, we have a very strict uh, risk management in production with stops and other uh, things that would protect the investor from worst cases. But this is, uh, you don't need to worry about that as font. Uh, this is something we worry about together with the investor. Uh, it's also the investor who gets to select the, uh, the level of risk that they want to trade your strategy with. So let's assume your strategy impact is the volatility of a risk of 5%. Then the investor can easily trade the same strategy with 10% or 20%. Usually institutional investors want to have a higher volatility on their product. So we simply can leverage a strategy a factor of four if the investor desires to do that, and then put the appropriate risks, uh, risk stops in place. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, 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 you go first. Yeah, you go first. Yeah. Um, your machine learning method, do you use decision tree or ensemble method? Um, all right. Well, I mentioned random forests, which are consist of decision they consist of decision trees and they are ensemble methods by definition. So, and uh, I, I have tried them. I mean, I can't say whether I ended up using them or not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, why not? <laughs> so just out of curiosity, you mentioned like uh, uh, you quoted some numbers before in terms of like uh, uh, the size of the funds per week. Is the algorithm that he's running, is that like a consistent portion of the total fund running every single day, or did that change? And like, can you give a sense of how that works a little bit? Sure, yeah. Um, the question was how our allocation between the algorithms that we actually trade exactly. changes over time. Uh, and if it does, uh, no, it, it only changes with the performance of the algorithm. So uh, we allocate uh, 
our current allocations are uh, results of our competitions. So people like Virginia who won the competition get an initial investment of a million dollars and are entitled to, to that investment basically as long as their algorithm keeps performing on that data. Uh, yeah, so these allocations don't change, but of course the amount of uh, SS under management changes with the success or failure of the algorithm over time. So at the moment we have seven algorithms uh, that we trade with our own money. Uh, yeah, and we're, like I said, pretty happy that we have an all time line today. Uh, yeah, overall algorithms together, not every single algorithm, but all together. Yes? Um, I'm kind of curious to uh, follow up on how that might change as you open up institutional investors. You know, um, are you know, so maybe you might have a billion dollars on the platform or something, and if you're really popular, you're one now worth about a hundred million dollars. Is that kind of how it's going to go? Or? Um, how it's going to go with institutional investors, so how, how they select the algorithms or how they uh, play their money around between yeah, different yeah, algorithms? Yeah, I mean, what are all the potential markets? What are some of the different scenarios other than mm -hmm. just when you managing your preset allocations that you set? Yeah, okay. Set? Okay, what are the scenarios as we open up? So we, we are the first marketplace, that's, that's the vision, so we want to connect your algorithm to capital from institutional investors. Um, not all the other on our platform will have investments, obviously, but the top five to ten percent will most likely have investments. Um, our target is to work with institutional investors. That's why we also work with futures and highly scalable strategies on daily data. That means that every single one, every, every single strategy in our platform should at least be able to uh, handle ten million. So, uh, Genius a strategy, for example, I did the math recently, uh, can handle three hundred million AUM. But there is a cap to every strategy, how much money it can handle, uh, with a reasonable uh, market impact. Uh, and yeah, we have to compute that on an individual basis. This is how, uh, how much money the strategy puts in liquid or illiquid uh, assets, basically. There's a cap, and we would never take more assets under management for a strategy than that cap. But other than that, institutional investors are free to select from the portfolio. We provide them, of course, with active advice as well based on correlations on their own portfolio, what they have and what they've discussed with their strategies. And we make them a suggestion, but it's up to them. Yes? Uh, how often are your competitions and when is the next one coming up? How often are the competitions and the next one, when is it coming up? Uh, usually quarterly. Uh, we're keeping that pace probably for this year. So uh, you can expect the next competition to be to end at June 30 this year. Uh, we will call it the Q6 or sixth competition. Um, and we're going to announce it probably in one or two weeks from now. But there will be a next competition that will be pretty similar to the previous competitions. Um, what do you think the set strategy like? You said there were seven activities for this strategy. Do you think those strategies, or did you pick them out independently, or did you pick them out on like how they potentially work together? So basically, like mm -hmm. another scenario where, like, for example, he said, and I'm correct if I'm wrong, that your particular strategy uh, correlated with the market. But like maybe you want to pick another strategy that yeah. doesn't correlate to the market, just to hedge against the other strategies. Does yeah. that affect how you guys? Uh, at the moment, uh, the question was how we select the strategies and how their uh, correlation or how well they work together affects our decision to allocate uh, money to them. Uh, the answer to the question is at the moment we don't select uh, strategies other than uh, their performance in our competitions. So the only selection that we have in place uh, is actually uh, we take the sharp ratio of the back test, we simulate your strategy, three months of live data, we take the best three strategies from three different ones and allocate capital to them. So it's a very, very simple approach, and that's not necessarily what you would do as a fund manager. I also want to add that. Uh, but we do it to incentivize people to submit trading algorithms and to give them uh, results after three months and not force them to wait for half a year or a year to see if their algorithm did well. So that's not what you would do as a fund manager. Uh, still, even by doing so, we're having a big problem. Any more questions? Yes? For the good trading algorithms, how large is the variance in the prediction? For the good trading algorithms, how large is the variance in the prediction? Um, the very good algorithms perform on live data equally well as they did in the backtest. So, prediction compared to the backtest is 
low, very low. This is also how our scoring works. Um, but it's enough to have a, life, uh, uh, a system with a life shock ratio of more than one. That's already great. Uh, so even if your bank system had a shock ratio of five and your life results has a shock ratio of one, it's still a good outcome. For the winning, uh, winning uh, strategies, what's the typical range of shock ratio, profit ratio? Okay, for the winning strategies, what's the typical range of shock ratios, profit ratios? Um, the typical range of shock ratio, I think Genio won the Q3 with a shock ratio of above two, with the, with the score yeah. of above two, yeah. uh, which means that his like result had a shock ratio of, of two, and then his impact was five or something, yeah, yeah. pretty, pretty high. Um, the typical range would be between one and two for winners of the competition. So in that three month period, usually a shop ratio between one and two, and then an allocation of this. Uh, performance wise, it's hard to tell because performance is just another uh, metric that, that doesn't per se matter that much to us, uh, only in, in, in only how it goes together with volatility. That's really the important thing. So performance alone, since you can leverage future strategies, uh, so change your strategies, uh, hover cars has, I think, a, uh, the volatility of only 4% and the performance then is not just... Let's put it in the bank, it's volatility of zero and you go on <laughs> There is no volatility of zero. <laughs> That's the problem. But this can be leveraged, so you can pretty much uh, adjust as an investor what kind of risk you would want just on the strategy. One last question. Yes? Maybe just one last question. One last question. Okay, last question for the evening. Yeah? Where are we going to post the slides? <laughs> in the meetup group. Uh, and yeah, we will post it on our website as well. All right.